morning. Welcome to the uh, MOOCs course of systems engineering and as we uh, continue in the learning more about systems engineering and the systems engineering process, uh, we dis decided to have a small case study today to see how the intricacies of the systems engineering process is put into place when a specific uh, scenario. So, today we will do a one example case study and what we are going to talk today is the unmanned aerial systems. Uh, typically what most of the people called as UAVs and when we talk about some aerial systems here and it is a systems engineering case study. So, we look into an indigenous development of an unmanned aerial system in India and how systems engineering was used to uh, realize the development of the unmanned aerial system. So, uh, before getting into the applications of unmanned aerial system and trying to find out what the unmanned aerial systems are about, how the systems have been put into development, what are their uses and this kind of stuff. Uh, for the benefit of the audience, we will have a small discussion on what UAS are and why they are important and what are the typical missions that they do. Uh, one of the most important thing that a systems engineer need to have is the person should have a background knowledge about the project that is going to happen. Uh, he or she need not be the expert in everything, but at least there should be sufficient the, the, the word that we use is working knowledge. The person should have sufficient working knowledge in that project that he or she is going to lead as a systems engineer. So, this initially we will talk about providing some working knowledge to the audience. And then we talk about how we went about developing the system, uh, developing the unmanned aerial system. So, um, we start with what is an unmanned aerial system? There are many, many, many definitions to this, you know, and many people have uh, talked about this in many ways. There are so many names for this and all those kind of stuff. But from the systems engineering standpoint, it is again a system. So, that is why we call it as UAS, unmanned aerial systems. It includes the vehicle, it includes the communication and all payload, every aspects of it which we will see. So, the UAV, the main part of it, the unmanned aerial vehicle, it is that airframe, it is the aircraft actually that operates, the airframe that operates without an onboard pilot it is called the unmanned aerial vehicle. So, there is no human being on the flying uh, platform to control it. So, it is a non-human there is no uh, specific individual or any human being is present there to control the aircraft. It is being controlled um, from a remote location. So, that is one of the other reasons uh, why it is also called as RPV. RPV stands for remotely piloted vehicle. Some people also call it as RPA that is remotely piloted aircraft. Uh, some people also call it as pilotless aircraft, robot planes, there are many names for it. And obviously, yes, the most common name which we call as drones. Okay. Uh, we are not going to get into the details of where does this nomenclature and other stuff came in. It is very common that people have names and pet names and different type of nomenclature that they use. So, uh, as far as the systems engineering a systems engineer is concerned. Our term is UAS, unmanned aerial system, which we uh, focus on the system. We do not focus about just whether it is a drone or RPV or something like that. So, the UAS, what we call about as a system, the total unmanned aerial system for a systems engineer includes the unmanned aerial vehicle, the UAV, the flying platform plus its ground control, navigation, data link and acquisition, payload, all those aspects together gives you the UAS, unmanned aerial system. So, in a broader sense, the systems engineer look at UAS, unmanned aerial system having five parts. So, the UAS, we can think about it as the UAS is the sum of UAS equal to the airframe, which you can call it as a UAV plus the propulsion, you can talk about as the control some people also call the control as the autopilot, but it is a control system plus communications. 
Some people colloquially call this as antenna, but it is not just antenna, there are so many other things as part of this plus payload. So, these five systems, one airframe, two propulsion, control, communication and payload together gives us the unmanned aerial system. So, a systems engineer is supposed to look into the, when we talk about the development of an unmanned aerial system, it is the development of all these five individual systems to meet the user needs as we said earlier. And uh, just to, uh, if you ask why are we talking about unmanned aerial systems as an example, a case study, it is one of the most uh, advancing field currently and lot of new and new systems are being developed in this area. So, a simple example of this is US Department of Defense, uh, the inventory of drone or UAVs or unmanned aerial systems, they increased from just 167 to 7500 in a time period of just 8 years and the 7500 increased to 10,000 uh, in a span of just 3 years. So, if you think about it or 11,000 uh, sorry 4,000 US, 3,964 3, UAVs. Um, so, what I am saying here is the number of unmanned aerial systems that are being developed, designed uh, and then used in the field are quite large and they are used for multiple purposes. So, this is one area lot of systems engineering, um, tricks, trades, tools are being applied. So, it makes this a relevant case for us to understand uh, how systems engineering can be applied to a development of a complex system. Yes, people can say that unmanned aerial systems are not that complex as such, uh, probably, but we are not worried about taking a too complex of a system. We are worried about taking a system with sufficient complexity. The aim here is understand a system with sufficient complexity. The complexity is sufficient enough for us to understand systems engineering uh, aspects. So, for that US I believe it is a good option. So, why unmanned aerial system? The Why people go behind unmanned aerial system? Why are we moving away from a not moving away, why are we augmenting or we are increasing the fleet size of unmanned aerial systems when compared to the piloted aircrafts? Because there are some major advantages for unmanned aerial systems. The first and foremost advantage is it supports the 3 D missions or the dull, dirty and dangerous missions. So, the if you are talking about uh, flying very low and taking pictures. Now, uh, then UAV is a better bet than a piloted aircraft because if a piloted aircraft is shot down, then the aircraft is lost and there is a high chance of loss of life to the pilot. It is always the loss of a pilot is way more expensive uh, and it takes a long time to substitute that expertise when compared to losing an aircraft. So, having a manned aircraft to do this 3 Ds, the dull, dirty and dangerous missions is quite expensive a proposition. So, this is in a way it minimizes pilot risk. So, in these such kind of missions which are dull, dirty and dangerous missions, it is better to use a UAS or unmanned aerial system rather than using a piloted aircraft that is one thing. Second part is it is cost effective, it is much cheaper to produce and operate because the entire human machine interface, what we call as cockpit plus all those redundancies and everything uh, that are part of the entire manned aircraft is just not there. And, and that in hence in that way uh, we also do not need things like uh, oxygen cylinders or uh, you know uh, pressurized the cabin all those aspects or a seat and then ejection mechanisms. Now, other safety features, all those aspects we do not really need to uh, uh, spend money on. So, hence the development of a unmanned aerial system, the aircraft in itself is quite a cheaper proposition than development of a manned piloted aircraft. So, it is a much cost effective solution. Then as we said earlier, it minimizes pilot life risk. So, because the pilot life is many, many times expensive than the aircraft itself. So, the pilot is a very expensive resource and you are saving an expensive resource uh, from by performing 
simple dull, dirty and dangerous mission. So, that is one other aspect how do you reduce the pilot risk. Then the endurance is not limited by human abilities. Like for example, if you make a UAV, you can make the UAV run fly for 24 hours. Uh, if you want to do that missions like for example, the Global Hawk and all, the endurance is more than 24 hours. Actually, there are UAVs which are in, in endurance greater than 24 hours. Uh, it is usually impossible for a human being to fly an aircraft for 24 hours without losing attention and all those kind of things because our attention span has limitations. We have aspects like uh, fatigue, the pilot fatigue comes into picture, then uh, reduced motor skills as time progresses, the motor abilities reduces, then the decision making powers reduces, uh, then the cognitive powers comes into uh, uh, starts reducing. So, all those things um, comes into picture. So, the duration, so as the mission elongates, then the uh, chances of pilot making a mistake also exponentially goes up. Similarly, the amount of g-force or the uh, like a, if an aircraft rapidly uh, changes its direction while flying at a very high speed, then the pilot experiences uh, g-force and the, they usually wear a g-suit to actually compensate for that. But uh, and you have to limit the amount of g-force. Uh, an aircraft can pull because there is a limit to which a human body can tolerate on that. When you do not have a pilot, you are actually in a much better situation to deal with or ask the UAV to take a tough uh, maneuver uh, where it is pulling way much more g force than what a human body can tolerate because there is no living being inside it or no human being is piloting that aircraft. So, many of the human capabilities since the human is out of the aircraft, the limiting aspects of the human is also removed and hence uh, the, it, the machine is not just limited by the capabilities of the operator. There are some disadvantages also, not, it is not just a completely great figure. There are mainly safety considerations, mid-air collisions. As such, uh, there is uh, so no uh, human being on board. So, there is nobody there to make, make decisions up, uh, according to what the TCAS uh, alarm is saying. The TCAS says, okay, there is somebody else uh, coming to collide you. So, you know, uh, the pilot is trained. If you hear the TCAS alarm, uh, it says go down or nose down. The pilot just nose down the aircraft. The other pilot noses up and the collision is avoided typically. Uh, but uh, there is no pilot to do that. So, a computer, you, have, you are pretty much dependent upon a computer to do that. And also other thing is that lack of certified pilots. Outside military uh, operations, there are not many quali qualified pilots to operate drones. So, most of the people who fly it in the civilian world, they are hobby flyers, what we call it. So, the hobby flying, uh, they might not, they will, they, they are most of the people are self-taught and most of the people also do not have gone, through, are not gone through the rigorous training that uh, 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 military pilot would have gone through or military UAV pilot would have gone through. So, hence the approach can also be become quite uh, lax at or people who are flying it because you are not sitting in the aircraft. So, you can there is a tendency that with, with the lack of proper training, uh, you have a much higher chance of a much higher stand a much higher risk of uh, creating mishaps. Then about the regulatory authorities. Uh, everybody is still confused. So, it is like we are talking about uh, no solid or clear regulations. We also know how the regulatory authority in India is dealing with uh, the UAV uh, question. Uh, basically, at this point, we are not planning to deal with it unless somebody else comes up with that. So, all the regulatory authorities are also in a soup with how to deal with this. And again, the lack of real time decision making or the casual attitude. Uh, as I said earlier, you are not flying the aircraft, you are not sitting in that aircraft, uh, you are flying from a safety of the ground. So, uh, the pilots who are not very well trained and who are not very well emphasized upon the risks that are involved in it, they can take a casual attitude and it could result in a much bigger uh, damage. So, that also are one of the disadvantage. And uh, typically unmanned aerial systems are classified in many ways. Uh, most of the time, the altitude and the range are the two parameters that are used to classify this. So, to a large extent, when you are designing this as a systems engineer, these are the two parameters. 
So, the system design also looks into these two parameters also looks into the two parameters they are important for us. So, the altitude and the range altitude is basically uh, if you draw a diagram if this is called this ground level the height at which the UAV is flying this is what we call as the altitude. The many ways this can be called as a AGL above ground level or if you talk about a C this can be talked about as an above sea level ASL, AGL there are many many ways you can specify the altitude. Uh, at least there is a so either the ground level is a reference point or the sea level is a reference point. So, these are the reference points. So, the altitudes are usually specified based on the ground level or sea level and then range is if you take off from this location then how far it can operate and this radius within which the UAV can operate this we can talk about it as the range uh, or we talk about the radius of the circle if you draw a big circle how much it can do. So, based on which the UAV has uh, range it sometimes translates to what we call as an endurance also, but we will talk about that later. So, the range is basically the uh, radius of the circle that it can uh, fly at to the maximum without loss of communication alright. So, uh, the um, there are many agencies who classify UAVs, but the EU, EUVA classification the European Union classification is the uh, pretty much like this the UAVs that have a 25 kilometer or less range. So, if this R is equal to 25 kilometers and then uh, it is called as a lightweight system. Typically, these type of UAVs fly about uh, 5000 feet from the ground. So, that is the idea. So, this classification is called as a lightweight UAV systems. If the range is between 25 to 100 kilometers and LOS stands for LOS is equal to line of sight. So, the communication is through line of sight and they typically fly up to an altitude of 10,000 feet and mostly then those UAVs are called as short range UAVs 25 to up to the height of 10,000 feet you can think about it as 10,000 feet altitude. Then we talk about a medium range UAVs okay, uh, which are between 10 to 200 kilometers they typically again operate on li line of sight LOS communication and you could actually fly another UAV to enhance the range. So, what happens is you have your ground antenna here you have one UAV flying here uh, this one UAV that is flying it is communicating with the ground and then here is another UAV that is flying uh, and this UAV is communicating with this particular UAV. So, this type of a communication back and forth uh, this is so this could probably if it could fly to 150 kilometers if this is the range and then this could probably fly to another 100 kilometers by enhancing the range. So, this kind of a thing is called as a range enhancement or with a second UAV or this UAV is typically called as a relay UAV which relays in between ok. So, that type of a range enhancement is also possible such UAVs are typically called as a medium range UAV they typically fly at an altitude about uh, flight level 18 and those kind of stuff 18,000 feet 20,000 feet up to 20,000 feet above the ground or something like that is what they fly mostly. Then comes the long range UAV whose range is 200 plus kilometers because after 200 kilometers the line of sight communication becomes a problem because of the earth's curvature. Uh, if you do not know you possibly should read it uh, because the earth is kind of like this and uh, you have an antenna and uh, the communication at after some point of time the curvature will result in the signal not being able to transmit it. So, typically people say that this is 200 or 250 kilometers is the max we can talk about getting here uh, in a line of sight. Otherwise, you would require another relay UAV if not you require what we call as a SATCOM. SATCOM stands for satellite communication it is satellite communication. So, the big UAVs the uh, one that are used in people what we call as drones or the uh, predator reaper you know uh, all those kind of big UAVs that are used in combat they actually fall in the long range UAV they pretty much fly uh, 40, 50,000 feet above the ground uh, and then they are able to do very long missions for like 24 hours non-stop flying and uh, dealing uh, providing data 
uh, video feedback and all those kind of stuff. So, these are typically the classifications and depending upon what the customer wants, you might end up building in a UAV in one of these classes. So, this classification you should also know because you should probably decide what are the UAV you are going to build based on the customer needs or what type of a UAV would satisfy the customer needs that one should be able to understand. So, what are the typical missions of UAVs or UAS unmanned aerial system missions? There are a lot of them. This is just a just, just a representative list, not an exhaustive list. Please remember that, okay? Not exhaustive. There are so many more missions that UAVs are used for currently. We are not listing everything. We are just talking about the main important missions. So, the first and foremost mission that they are used for is called as ISR missions. It is intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance missions. So, uh, intelligence gathering and your surveillance means you are keeping track of something. A reconnaissance means you are actually assisting a. So, there is a difference between a surveillance and a reconnaissance operations. Surveillance means you are basically only dependent upon the machine, only machine. Whereas, recon it involves machine and a man. There is a human being also there. So, uh, this is usually uh, done at the time of special operations, special forces does this quite a lot more. This is surveillance is done for any battle or, or any wartime operations. So, uh, the, the ISR operations UAVs are heavily used, then they are also used in strike. Many we read in left, right and center newspaper saying that drone strike has killed this many people. So, it is used to uh, launch lethal weaponry against the enemy. Resupply, they are also used for resupplying troops at very tough situations. Uh, like presently, uh, we use helicopters to supply the people or the troops in Siachen. Uh, but if you think about it, it is a very risky operation because of the extremely uh, inhospitable weather and uh, flying conditions. So, we have a UAV, then it, uh, it they, so, and all resupply missions uh, currently at um, high altitude uh, war locations put the life of the pilot, the person who is flying the aircraft at risk. So, UAVs are a much better option to do that type of a mission. Then we talk about CSR which is combat search and rescue. So, if people lo get lost in, people get lost in a, in a big uh, uh, location or a jungle or a battlefield or a desert or something like that. Uh, if you are looking for uh, people, and you want to keep on flying without tiredness and keep looking for whether the you can find the missing troops, then UAV is a much better option. Uh, having a manned aircraft after some time, the pilot will be feeling fatigued and he might miss things uh, or he or she might miss, miss things. Whereas, a UAV with a high resolution camera pointed down, you can keep uh, you can keep on changing the person who is watching the video at the ground. With a, when the person is approaching a fatigue level and you can keep on continue to search for the missing troops uh, without the endurance of the pilot being worried about because the UAV is flying as long as it has fuel. Then another thing is also for refueling, refueling missions take, are currently quite risky because this is uh, you are, so this refueling we talk about does aerial refueling. So, such an operations UAVs are a much better choice because currently you are putting two different aircrafts at risk while doing a, a aerial refueling. So, there are researches being going on to develop UAVs that can be flying um, fuel dispensers in the uh, sky. So, they are just they will just keep on flying with the fuel there and uh, other aircrafts will go there and uh, take the fuel from that uh, flying platform and then uh, continue to enhance continue to fly or enhance the range. Then air combat is another one where you are talking about uh, uh, fighting the enemy in the air in itself which is usually um, air to air combat or some people call it as dog fight and those kind of things. We are not talking about dog fight or uh, those kind of movies, we are talking about uh, dealing with the enemy or combating the enemy in the air. So, that is also a part of the um, uh, UAS missions. Then mapping, this involves what we call as geographical or topological operations. So, most of the time uh, people use uh, things like uh, LIDAR to scan the uh, terrain and then create the topo topographical map to figure out the, to create 3D profile of the uh, area to estimate quantities, you would find contours and those kind of stuff. 
So, the GIS related operations, so this some people also called as GIS geographical information system related operations have definitely got a boost by the advent of unmanned aerial systems. Similarly, it can be also used for asset monitoring, crop monitoring, traffic monitoring, etc. Lot of monitoring operations, these are mostly civilian operations. So, you can see the monitor the highway, traffic jams uh, from a re remote locations and then control traffic lights accordingly. You can also use to monitor crops across a wide large area of farming land to see whether there is any attack by pest or uh, the crops are getting matured, when to do the harvesting, all those kind of things can be studied as part of this. Then we can also talk about asset monitoring. The asset monitoring like uh, for example, assets uh, like oil pipelines, etc which requires regular monitoring um, can be monitored here easily because you can instead of sending an, a, a few human beings and a vehicle uh, which they continue to drive wherever the oil pipeline is, you can actually have a UAV fly across the pipeline and use high resolution cameras to actually monitor the stuff. Similarly, environmental operations like uh, this is like stuff like pollution monitoring or pollution uh, check which is like particulate matters and all those kind of things yeah. and then the uh, measuring the uh, level of uh, different type of pollutants in the air, all those aspects can be taken care of by the unmanned aerial systems. So, you I hope by this you have a fairly clear idea about uh, what is an unmanned aerial system and what are some of the particular missions associated with this. So, now we get into the uh, aspect of how we developed the uh, unmanned aerial system for the uh, or how we went about applying systems engineering principles to develop the UA unmanned aerial system which was a small unmanned aerial system. Uh, we are not talking about a larger development that is still under development, we are talking about a smaller system here, but it is uh, it is a good example. So, first uh, here we will start with what we call as the customer requirements. So, uh, the customer requirements in this case uh, again this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, I just put some of the customer requirements which we thought uh, which I thought about was important to begin with and then we will keep on adding more customer requirements as we continue to discuss this case throughout the rest of the uh, course uh, at different stages. Uh, but uh, initially uh, when we discussed with the customer, uh, it was uh, uh, because we do not have explicit permission from the customer, so we are not divulging the details. But when we talked about the customers initially about what type of UAV they were looking for, the question was that these, these UAVs were typically supposed to be used for surveillance operations. So, the idea was that uh, surveillance operations was the main main application and so uh, and also uh, they wanted to uh, operate within a reasonable range. We will talk about what it is uh, as the we go through the customer requirements. So, the first customer requirement that was presented to us and by the way remember the customer will never prioritize the uh, requirements. The customer will keep on saying the requirements as and when the customer feels or customer remembers something. So, this is kind of the order in which they kind of initially mentioned it, I actually uh, picked it up from my notes at that time. So, the first one that was told was it should be easily easy to assemble uh, instead of the endurance, instead of the altitude and all those kind of things, the customers first statement was it should be easy to assemble. It should be a modular system that can be carried on the back of a jeep or a gypsy. So, back means the tailgate of the jeep or a gypsy. So, that was the first thing, so it should, be, it should fit in the back of a jeep or a gypsy. Okay, good one requirement. Then it should be having a capability to do short takeoff and landing from flat surfaces. Okay, uh, whether it's paved or unpaved, it doesn't matter. It should take off from a flat surface, paved or unpaved. So that we ask like paved means what? So then we will talk about how we ask these questions later. Not now because it will confuse you. But whether it's paved or unpaved, customer wanted it to take off from a flat surface and within a short length. So it is kind of customer is saying that I do not have a too long of a field. So, you do not have the luxury to keep on flying to reach the speed to take off. So, take off quickly as possible from the flat surface whether it is paved or unpaved, do not ask for a runway kind of a thing. Then uh, the third one that was mentioned was autonomous flight capability. 
uh, when upon um, probing further they said the flight should be controlled by an onboard autopilot with multiple flight boards. So, once a aircraft takes off and reaches an altitude you switch on a button and the autopilot takes over and the mission is pre-programmed and then the autopilot just keeps on doing that mission as it is being programmed. So, and that uh, no human interference is necessary uh, or the or what they wanted to say is that, uh, that while the takeoff and landing can be managed by a human being, the flying for the entire duration of the operation should be done by the system itself. Uh, then you are not going, nobody is going to fly an aircraft for that entire duration from standing from the ground. Um, so, that was made pretty clear. Then uh, the payloads were mentioned as multiple surveillance and environmental sensing payloads uh, should be used. Uh, we were, we initially were in the listening mode, so we did not really probe too much into this and we dug it later. As I said, it is an iterative process, so we got more details out of it in the different iterations. And endurance, well it was given as a range to us, uh, pretty much like 3 hours to 8 hours of endurance. So, it should fly for 3 hours or should from 3 hours to 8 hours. So, the minimum time was 3 hours of flight time and maximum flight time that was given to us was 8 hours. So, have an endurance uh, between 3 to 8 hours. It should have redundant communication. Mm, redundant means even if one uh, communication channel is lost, there should be another communication channel available to still uh, op recover the UAV. So, one other thing was that uh, the customer also looked for some level of redundancy that was clear from that. So, the but the redundancy was specified in the communication, not in something else. So, uh, okay, the customer wanted redundant communication, so it is what it is. Customer is the one who gives you the requirements or the needs and you design the system accordingly. And the time to assemble, even though they said the easy to assemble system, then the customer came up and said, okay, it should be assembled within 20 minutes. So, that means they would expect the UAV to be in a knockdown stage to transport from place A to place B and when you reach a particular location, then you should be able to assemble it quickly and then fly it. So, approximately they expected it to be fly, get ready to fly. So, assembly means uh, ready to fly in 20 minutes. Then uh, it was supposed to be also used in what you call as a low intensity uh, conflict. Uh, low intensity conflict are uh, uh, LIAs are typically, we typically this is abbreviated in military language as LIA low intensity, uh, L, sorry LIC uh, low intensity conflicts or LIA is low intensity action. Uh, either way is fine. So, low intensity conflict uh, what happens is uh, you are this the firing is mostly be, or the conflict is mostly using small arms and other stuff. So, here the most important role of the UAV is to provide situational awareness to the commanders to figure out what is going on and then take uh, tactical action or, or two tactics based on what the uh, overall view the bird's eye view of the situation is all about. So, the situational awareness to the commanders was one of the major issue or major uh, more crystallized role. Uh, it should be silent to operate. Uh, so, it is kind of a double edged sword that so that you cannot never make a, a flying aircraft completely silent, it is kind of extremely difficult to do. Uh, but when they said silent means uh, when we discuss them further, then they we were able to get into a further measurable quantity. But see that this is a ambiguous requirement. Uh, because you cannot really measure what is silent. Okay. So, that silence was not quantified in this regard. Again, the redundance communication system that is also an ambiguous requirement. So, there is a lot of ambiguity initially when the customer puts the requirements to you and it is your job as a systems engineer to remove this ambiguity later down the road. And then uh, they also said should be outside the range of small arms fire. So, it is partially ambiguous. So, so, so small arms you assume that they are basically assault rifles or something like that. So, if a person takes an assault rifle and starts shooting at the sky, the bullet should not reach the UAV. That is probably what the uh, customer meant or it also at some point of time long range uh, sniper rifles like 50 caliber rifles are also small arms. But that the range of a 50 caliber uh, ri rifle projectile and a normal uh, assault rifle projectiles are quite different. Um, those can actually travel a couple kilometers uh, the uh, 50 caliber rifles. So, is that also considered as small arms? So, that ambiguity was still there, but um, anyway uh, you can see that uh, so the customer is looking for a UAV that is not a huge one that is quite clear from this. 
because they want to transport it using a jeep or a gypsy. I mean jeep we are talking about is Indian scenario about that Mahindra jeep uh, that is being used in uh, various paramilitary forces. And uh, they want it mostly for surveillance so that means you are not interested in looking into uh, arming the UAV or you are not talking about dropping something or you are talking about having a lethal payload anyway. So with this idea the first round when the customer has specified all of these kind of things the first thing is the systems engineer would do is ask many questions to find remember some of the things that uh, we talked about it is it is a question of it is a process of inquiry and resolution. Okay. So we started doing inquiry and resolutions and from there a bunch of specifications were arrived at okay, or specifications were achieved and I am going to show you the specifications uh, and then after that I will explain to you how we reach those specifications uh, in, the, in the process. So the, the specifications that were developed uh, after discussion with uh, the um, uh, cu customer multiple rounds of iterations happened. So the first thing was that um, the payload surveillance payload so it was decided as a camera based payload. So it was asked whether you would need a what type of a camera. So they said it, either you are we are flying in the night or we are flying in the day. So we want one type of camera at this time because see when the day, time changes from day or a night we will change the payload it is not an issue for them. So they do not want to fly with two payloads they just wanted to fly with one payload. So we said okay fine a single camera payload it can be a day camera or a night camera you can switch excuse me you can switch the camera according to your wish. Uh, but that is how it was uh, thought through in our case. Then the communication they talked about it as a redundant communication they said they needed redundant communication upon inquiry it was clarified that they would require the redundancy in telemetry. Telemetry means the communication from the ground to the aircraft it should be redundant. Uh, they do not mind if the video uh, or the video feed gets cut off the real time video feeds get cut off they do not mind for few minutes but they want the telemetry not to cut off. So then two separate channels two frequencies were chosen uh, I am sorry uh, two frequencies were chosen and in both frequencies telemetry happened. So one was telemetry and the other was also telemetry other had a telemetry plus video. So uh, even if one shuts off then the other uh, channel is available always so that the outer, the aircraft remain in communication with the ground control throughout the uh, duration of the mission. Uh, so that was sorted out we did not I did not specify this clearly here but yes that is how it was sorted out 21 kilogram maximum takeoff weight was the next one. So the weight of the UAV the maximum takeoff weight was classified to 21 kilograms. So they said they wanted a small UAV and all those kind of things should fit the back of jeep or a gypsy it was crystallized which was derived and finally concluded at 21 kg as the ideal weight that is uh, required. They said it should take off from a short surface and finally it was 30 meter uh, distance uh, fly uh, run time for takeoff from a paved or an unpaved surface. Paved include uh, runways or it can also include what you call as a public road and unpaved includes even a flat uh, field which is uh, compacted with a level ground. Then the endurance finally was uh, kept at 8 hours uh, you are all you can all upper limit is endurance is 8 hours you can always fly less than that uh, by controlling the amount of fuel that you are carrying or by control changing the, the controlling the number of batteries you are carrying. Um, so because uh, the, uh, the one way to deal with the silence or the reduced noise was to actually do dual propulsion either gasoline or electric. So that was provided so hence 8 hours was the maximum endurance that was given and uh, that was decided low cost so per UAV cost was kind of fixed in the long run if you manufacture in large quantities how much the UAV should come to that amount was agreed to. Then the operational ceiling the maximum height so this is a ceiling AGL above ground level it should be able to fly at a maximum height of 5000 feet above ground level so that is something that was decided above ground level uh, again was decided because the major areas where the UAV will be put into place the operating environments were specified and then 5000 feet above that operating environment was not really a hard thing to achieve. So it was decided that at 5000 feet 
uh, at the specified environments. Some of the informations are not completely uh, divulged out because of uh, other reasons, but sufficient information is there to uh, take care of, uh, understand. Then the 20 minutes to finish the assembly. So, the assembly time was specified at 20 minutes and that is a measurable again a quantifiable uh, requirement. The, uh, the speed of the UAV, the maximum speed was sped at 100 km per hour. So, that is the uh, operating speed, the maximum operating speed uh, and also the radius, the operation radius was set at 150 km operation radius. Um, so, it is a line of sight operation, the LOS. So, 150 kilometers the UAV should be able to fly as far as from the base where it takes off. It uh, also we talked about having two propulsion, the gasoline as well as the electric propulsion because uh, flying silent was an important thing. So, in a gasoline you have to fly at a much higher altitude to uh, ensure that the noise is not heard by the people downstairs uh, or people in the ground whereas, in an electric you can fly at a much lower altitude. So, flying lower means you can actually get much more clearer pictures. So, that was the other reason. So, uh, depending upon the usage they could actually the same platform uh, can be used with a, dual, a propulsion of electric or a gasoline. All it needs is um, make the two things exactly the same ex except the propulsion changes. So, that mechanism was built in. Then the UAV's physical dimensions as we said earlier, uh, one of the output of it is some aspects will be uh, uh, of the operational plan out of the requirement analysis, other is the functional one and then is the physical one. So, here is an example of a physical 3.3 meters would was designed as the wingspan and 2.2 meters were taken as the length of the UAV. So, the wingspan is from the if you look from the top this is the fuselage you have two wings like this. So, wingspan means tip of the wing to the other tip of the wing. This was taken as 3.3 meters and let us say if there is a tail also here then this length to this length was taken as 2.2 meters as a total length of the UAV that way. And then obviously, as I said earlier it should be autopilot. So, it was decided that the takeoff and landing will be manual, um, takeoff landing will be manual and the other one is autopilot, the flying is autonomous. So, that is how it was decided. So, you can see that uh, some of them are, uh, some of these are physical some of these are operational and some of these are functional aspects. So, uh, at, at the end of the day all these things your functional uh, plan or your functional specifications, your physical specifications and your operation specifications all the three need to be in sync. So, these were the synced out synchronized um, uh, specifications that were derived out of this uh, process. And uh, we will talk about how these were done and all uh, little later down the road, but if you look at the complication of the system, uh, you can actually um, think about it as the UAV has like we again as I said earlier, we broke it down into an airframe, then we broke it down into the control systems, we talk it in the propulsion, communication and payload. So, this is the 5 major subsystems and there were so many of other things need to be thought through. So, like for example, there are different configurations were looked into there were different studies were done, fluid dynamics, aerodynamic derivatives were done, uh, computational fluid dynamic studies were done. Uh, then in between there were costings and repairability, uh, then programming, reliability, packaging, manufacturing, component selections, uh, you can see all those kind of stuff, different choos choosing of different uh, stuff which are uh, cords which are commercially off the shelf, cord stands for commercially off the shelf products. So, for cost reductions, so many things were done, different type of engines were compared and uh, picked up. Uh, so, if you look and the different type of sensors, antennas, amplifiers. So, you can see that multiple type of products uh, were like taken into and different alternatives were thought through. So, the user had one mission and as I said earlier, one of the aspects of this whole thing is to provide viable alternatives. Systems engineering job is to provide viable alternatives. So, in this case it is in itself in a simple process you can see that we had a UAV with a C tail, a U tail, a V tail and an H tail. So, there were 4 different platforms, 4 different design alternatives were created or developed as a as part of this exercise. So, that uh, uh, at the end of the day 
uh, once you are doing during the development you will be able to identify and choose the most uh, the best suited one as part of uh, the for the best suited platform which will actually fulfill the customer requirements and specifications to the best possible extent so remember we have we, we have requirements the customer requirements and we have what we call as constraints these are the two things that need to be satisfied so then all these different options were compared against as these and I finally uh, appropriate combination of the system was derived uh, or appropriate alternative was chosen which actually satisfies the uh, requirements and the constraints to the best possible extent. So uh, with this we will actually do is we will start getting into how these customer requirements were crystallized and how these were translated into tangible uh, specific needs as part of the uh, process as part of the systems engineering process and we will kind of see how systems engineering was applied in this whole exercise to realize this UAV. So um, uh, just as a quick recap of this uh, what uh, we studied here was uh, we had a basic introduction of what a UAV is I think I would recommend everybody to read a little bit more on what UAVs are and wh how what are they used uh, so there is so much of literature available in the uh, internet and as well as other books that are available on this I would recommend everyone to go through this uh, get much more background knowledge about UAVs because some of the stuff that we are going to talk about uh, in this requires some of this background knowledge so I suggest that you guys read and prepare for it because as we will be continuing this case in the next class so we will be discussing more about this so please have your background knowledge ready and also please remember all these customer requirements that were given uh, as a starting point and uh, it is not complete and as time progresses uh, I will add more customer requirements and how that additional information was elicited from the customer uh, this inquiry and resolution process how did it happen as a part of the requirement analysis we will actually run through different steps of it so that you have a clear idea of how to, how to conduct this requirement analysis processes clearly and uh, that is one part and then finally we talked about the specifications of the unmanned aerial system how those initial customer requirements were translated to what we call as it should be a verifiable uh, and it, it is also an achievable unambiguous you know uh, all those kind of things. So how did we come up across specifications those are verifiable that are achievable that are that are quantifiable uh, that are uh, uh, also um, uh, like achievable within a reasonable cost alternative solutions technically feasible all those aspects how did we uh, do all those things how did we create result how did all those reality checks were done in this process. Uh, uh, the requirement analysis to come across the crystallized to this level of the specifications which was finally agreed upon by the customer and also we will briefly discuss how we developed um, interdisciplinary teams teams for this process we will also discuss that and then finally as I said earlier how did we come up with the different alternatives uh, we will briefly look into this we won't spend too much time on this because quite a lot of things are cannot be divulged that much but to where whatever possible we will uh, clarify things to an extent where you have a broad idea of things but as, as I said earlier systems engineering job is to explore for uh, viable alternatives for the customer and then choose the appropriate one so how did we develop viable different viable alternatives is also part of the discussion uh, so with that we will start now crystallizing much more details in the next classes to come uh, but I would request everyone to again uh, I can't emphasize this strong enough please gain sufficient background knowledge about UAVs because from the next thing or unmanned aerial systems because the next class onwards we are going to start discussing on this and where I am going to assume that mean you have gained sufficient background knowledge so that is left to you um, so thank you for your patient listening.